Good day. This is Professor Mike Bernanke of the University of Detroit Mercy doing podcast number 27. Today is the 20th of May 2015. And this podcast is about a very unusual and almost accidental event in the history of Hollywood. Uh, I'd ask you please uh, to be connected to the Microscope, Volume 25, Issue 41, dated yesterday, May 19th, 2015. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you to Immersive Engineering, Immersive Engineering, our technical partners, to Oakland Schools, our secondary ed partner, and the University of Detroit Mercy, our higher ed partner. The scope was entitled, The Story of Hollywood's Biggest Mouth Ever. I know you thought that was Mike Bernanke, right? <laughs> well, not necessarily. Before June 1975, there were only two movie seasons, the holiday season and the other 10 months. Catch this. We reviewed the 100 biggest domestic box office movies of all time, inflated to $2,015, so it was a level playing field. We found that of the 42 that were released before 1975, only 16% of them opened during the summer, while 43% opened in November and December, uh, i.e. the holiday season, with December hosting 15 of those 19 flicks. From 1975 to 2014, however, the remaining 58 flicks of this biggest 100 list, of those 100, uh, biggest 100 list, 65% were released in the summer and only 26% were released during the holiday season. With the opening of Jaws, the floodgates, ha ha ha, the summer blockbusters were thrown wide open. Now that the movie industry was changed forever, it sharpened its teeth on its summer audience in many, many ways. Uh, please, and we'll discuss it right at the end of uh, this podcast, see the appendix of the top 30 movies of all time. From 100, we slimmed it to 30, so we can look at some of those movies. On to the Jaws tsunami and its little-known director, Steven Sil Spielberg. Before Jaws, Spielberg had only one feature flick to his credit, the Sugar Land Express one year before in 74, with Jaws being a pending disaster. Why? Well, it was twofold over its budget, plus or minus a few dollars, and budget was $4 million. It was threefold over its production calendar, 55 days, so already 160 plus days in running. But that said, the biggest revolution in Hollywood history was about to happen. Universal fearing that it was going to be capsized by the flick decided to widely release it at the end of June when Americans were at the beaches. Huh. With a possible fear of, what do you think, huh? And to support it, the big, a big TV campaign was issued. Both were extraordinary events because wide releases back in the day usually rolled to a wide release gradually rather than opening as such. In short, movies earned their wide releases. Secondly, movies rarely were fronted with big TV campaigns. The TV campaign was $700,000 back in 75 which amounts to about $3 million today. Conventional wisdom was not to spend money, by the way, on so small screen ads to draw its audiences to the big screen because small screen viewers love their TVs and would not go to movies anyway because they were saving money by this experience having a TV. And even if they did, would you give a competing medium TV versus uh, movies? Would you give TV ad dollars? That was utter heresy. The result, you ask? Of course, both failed and nobody ever heard of Jaws and it wasn't made. Oh, no, no. 
Jaws became the biggest box office success of all time till Star Wars in 1977 came along. The wide release and TV campaign grew the product line and revenue streams of Jaws and thereafter for all movies, almost from nowhere. Ice cream flavors such as vanilla, jawberry, and shark, <laughs> a late, existed. The bright idea of TV, of T-shirts, sweatshirts, etc., came bubbling from the seafloor, as did the plastic fins and game that came with it. The bright idea of T-shirts, sweatshirts, etc., came bubbling from the seafloor, as did uh, plastic fins and, and the game. Uh, a few years later came George Lucas's May of 1977 movie, Star Wars which with such an array of products that even today it seems unimaginable. Summers, once the wasteland of movie releases, became the tent poles of the industry, forging and forcing big brand repeats, sequels, prequels, remakes, etc. Even comic book heroes followed, as did multiplexes, to be able to seat the growing blockbuster summer central business. Finally, an industry that once only Hollywood existed in Hollywood was truly and had become truly global. 70% of today's total box office, total box office being almost $36.5 billion, is from foreign market. Wow. Let's take a look at a couple of uh, items that we have on the scope. One, the whole idea of 1975. We have a box right at the below of the uh, uh, below the just uh, red scope about Jaws on why it was such a blockbuster year. Well, let's see. Uh, it was a blockbuster year because uh, Jimmy Hoffa disappeared at a D Detroit restaurant. Margaret Thatcher's first appearance on the world stage came. The U.S. astronauts hooked up with the Soviet cosmonauts and also Bobby Fischer refused to play Karpov, Anatoly Karpov, uh, in a chess match. And Bobby Unser won his second Indy 500. Steelers beat Vikings in the Super Bowl. It was only the ninth Super Bowl. Ads cost a meager a hundred and seven thousand dollars for thirty seconds. Expected this year to be uh, four and a half to five million dollars. More about this at another time. The Watergate scandal broke. Bill Gates and Paul La Allen founded Microsoft. The Vietnam War ended. Jaws became the summer's first black blockbuster. Patty Hearst was America's most wanted, and was captured in San Francisco in. Uh, September. The thriller in Manila, where Muhammad Ali defeated Joe Fraser in October. Red Sox's Carlton Fisk homered in the 12th inning, but still, the Big Red Machine, Cincinnati's Big Red Machine, won the World Series. Would it be a few more years before the Red Sox finally got in and won a World Series? They hadn't won one in some years. My beloved Cubs still haven't won one since 1908. Uh, Saturday Night Live had its first showing at uh, November 11th, 11-11-75, with George Carlin being its first host. Ronald Reagan entered the presidential race also in November that year. If you turn the page now, if you put it out two pages, take a look at the top 30 box offices all time. You notice that... The, we have five of them shaded. The reason we have five of them shaded is because we don't have any worldwide box office for those. Mary Poppins in 1964, Cleopatra 63, American Graffiti 73, and Bambi in 42. Outside of that, you can see the list of them. All time, by the way, all these box offices are corrected to current dollars, 2015 dollars. And that's how they are ordered, by the way. Star Wars at almost one and a half billion dollars. Adjusted domestic box. Wow. Um, by the way, its unadjusted box was uh, less than 500 
thousand dollars, and uh, only forty percent, forty and a half percent, was the um, as the world box office, with almost sixty percent being domestic U.S. and Canada box office. Then came after Star Wars. Then came E.T. What is E.T. known for in '82? Sure, Reese's Pieces, no doubt about it. Jaws, still the third biggest in corrected dollars, $1,875, over a billion dollars. Only 45% uh, was a foreign box office. Foreign box office development is really rather new. And then you can j go down these lists, this list, and you can see, you know, the sequels, sequels, prequels, uh, the movies that... Uh, uh, are unusual, uh, the movies that uh, take off from comic books and the things we mentioned before. If you'll notice on this top list, we have listed uh, 30 movies, if we forget the five that we had. One of that list, on that list of 20, I think it's 30 that we left after we took out the five, that was a comedy. And, uh, of course, Ghostbusters wasn't just, it was a sci-fi comedy. Comedies don't, uh, as we know, don't translate well in other countries. So we have a wonderful picture of the movie industry and the impact, of course, that came to the um, impact that came because of Jaws and how Jaws literally separated the uh, waters of the movie industry. No, Jaws wasn't Moses but pretty close to it. There's no doubt about it. This is Professor Mike Bernacki of the University of Detroit Mercy with Podcast 27 saying see you next time.